It is now my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. William Kenneth Wesley to speak on behalf of the JD class of 2008. It's hard to look cool in that hat, so I had to take it off. Hope you don't mind. Thank you to President Dan Angel, Dean Frederick White, faculty, students, friends, and family of Golden Gate. Special thanks to Professors Swartz, Kajin, Keen, Sylvester, Yamauchi, and Oppenheimer, professionals whose boundless enthusiasm for the law and its potential for good in the world is infectious. Also, thank you with love to my wife, Linda, who inspires me endlessly, my late parents, my children, my grandchildren, and all of my friends and family here today. I'm speaking today because Stacy, a classmate, suggested that I submit my name for a commencement speaker. Initially, I declined, thinking the honor should go to someone just starting out in life and career. But my classmate told me that I am Golden Gate. To her, I embody while this, why this institution was founded in 1901 and has thrived and educated thousands of working adults. And I thought about it. I realized my experience was very similar to a lot of my classmates. Many of us are married. Some have children. Some even have grandchildren. Many of us have careers or run our own successful businesses. And many of us worked full time while pursuing our degree. Many of us have traveled thousands of miles and overcome major obstacles en route to walking across this stage today. I began to see her point, that I might be a good example of what Golden Gate stands for, so I submitted this speech. I received my MBA with honors from this institution. I'm a former San Francisco Human Rights Commissioner, and I created the Stadium Scholarship Program to reward kids for hard work and good citizenship. But my life started in the projects of Hunters Point, San Francisco. I was the first, that's right. <laughs> I, I was the first of my siblings to graduate from college. When I received my undergraduate degree from USF, I noticed that many of my friends were receiving huge sums of money and lavish gifts from their grandparents. My grandfather, who had a sixth grade education, gave me this simple but important admonition work hard and save your money. I spent a lot of time wondering why I didn't receive such gifts. And then I realized that, one, my grandfather did what he could based on what he knew. Two, we can't act on what we don't know. Three, we do, however, have an obligation to learn. And four, once we learn, we are obligated to act. As I stand here today as a grandfather myself, I realize that the gift my grandfather gave me was far more important than the cars and the money my then classmates received. We, the class of 2008, have just spent the last three to four years learning the law and its application in our society. We now know, so we are now obligated to act. Why law? I think that law can carve humanity out of anarchy. I think that law is the last best hope of the disenfranchised. One of my personal heroes, the late Supreme Court Justice and legend Thurgood Marshall, in a speech on the Constitution said, what is striking is the role that legal principles have played throughout America's history in determining the condition of peoples of African descent. They were enslaved by law, emancipated by law, segregated and disenfranchised by law, and finally have begun to win equality by law. Along the way, new constitutional principles have emerged to deal and meet the challenges of a changing society. The progress has been dramatic, and it will continue." End quote. And here we are today with a person of African descent running for the highest office in the land, and a woman running for the highest office in the land. I also know that the law can be used as a baton to bludgeon the spirit. Consider the Dred Scott decision, Plessy versus Ferguson, the genocide of the Native American, the law against women voting, 
and the internment of Japanese Americans, to name a few. The law can and should evolve, and those who've been blessed with the ability to wield its power have an obligation to do so. Once you know, you are obligated to act. So that's the heavy stuff. Now to the graduating class. <laughs> Congratulations to you and your family. You have just completed one of your life's greatest accomplishments. Make sure that you thank your family for their emotional, their physical, and their financial support on this journey. Many of us are about to take the bar in a couple of months. And regardless of your outcome at that phase of the voyage, keep the life story of this hero in mind. In his 20s, he failed in business, his sweetheart died, and he had a nervous breakdown. In his 30s, he was defeated for Congress. In his 40s, he was defeated for Vice President and the Senate. But at age 51, he was elected President of the United States. This is the story of Abraham Lincoln. Why is Lincoln's story important to us today? Because throughout his life, he faced many more defeats than victories. But because he never gave up, he became arguably, arguably the greatest president in U.S. history. However, a successful life journey is not just based on what you can achieve with dogged determination. Life is more than that. Full life success can come when you keep the five principles in mind that my late mother, Mrs. Zora Campbell, tried to live her life by. First, do no harm. Second, make things better. Third, respect others. Fourth, be fair. And fifth, be loving. In the end, I want you to know that most great things are brought about with the help of others. There's an African proverb that states, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go with others. Thank you.